news. Preparing live stream. Preparing live stream. T minus three, two, one, I guess. Live. I don't know. We are live, I guess, and welcome out to our halftime report. Uh, Matt, go ahead and play that intro video. I like it. I like yeah. it a lot. Well, I think it needs to be longer, you know, probably about 30 seconds. Let it kind of hang out, sit there. We do an hour show. We don't need a 10 second intro like we're doing a one minute video, right? So we can work on it, uh, working on it one step at a time. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome out to our halftime report here at Tackle Trading. This is Tim Justice, Coach T, and my brother Matt Justice, and coming to you from Utah and coming to you from the Tackle Trading channel. Matt, uh, the market wants to hit an all time high here. Are we going to do it today? I don't think we're going to do it today, but it certainly has that feeling. You know, we've talked about these feelings in the past, um, but uh, there is a psychology to the market, Tim, and it does have a feeling that the market wants to reach that all time high. Uh, we got a nice little follow through pattern. We got strength coming into it. Uh, you know, the, these breakout patterns when you're breaking out of the previous high, these are very high probability type patterns. Some of the best patterns in the market are breakout patterns. In fact, Tim, out of all the patterns in the market, a breakout off of retracement, high bases, cup and handles, ascending triangles, symmetrical triangles, reversal patterns, uh, retracements, whatever the pattern is, wouldn't you say that the breakout pattern is probably the strongest of those patterns? I love breakouts. I love teaching breakouts. I think from a simplicity standpoint, for most traders, it's a clean, simple entry and exit. Now, by the way, one of the most important things with breakouts is mindset. Uh, I have run into uh, some circumstances, Matt, where people fail to, to take the entry on a breakout because they like buying stuff cheap, right? They like buying the retracement. You yeah. Know? They do. They, 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 you know, I've taught a lot of people. You've taught a lot of people. I think the, the retracement is such an easier pattern at first to really kind of understand. You understand the higher high, the higher low. You're picking it up out, off a of support level. Like you said, you're picking it up at a cheap price. You've seen the high price before, you know, you've seen it be up here before. So when we're looking at this, the market's overextended and you're like, oh, I, I wish I would have picked it off, uh, off this retracement. And then it does the, just that it comes back down into a support level at 2,800. And you're like, oh, I can get that. But the, the, the simple truth, Tim, is as it's coming down, you're actually buying into weakness here. It's, it's a good pattern. We love that pattern. We've talked about it quite a bit on the halftime report. But as it's going up, 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 you're actually buying into strength as it is starting to go back up. So mm -hmm. the breakout pattern is a little bit <clears throat> of a higher probability type setup. And, you know, like we've talked about in the past, a very helpful tool to understand breakouts and if the breakout can continue to run is simply adding an indicator called RSI on your, uh, on your chart here. The relative strength indicator helps you understand if it can run even more. Mm -hmm. And as it's breaking out of this 2850 level, as you can see here today, RSI is at 63 underneath the overvalued zone at 70. That tells me that this puppy still has room to breathe. It still has room to run. And when you look at it from an all-time high perspective on the S&P 500, the all-time high is 2878. And I'll tell you, just... You know, with the RSI still having strength going back up, with the with the candle showing strength going back up, with the uh, the the sediment in the market right now being a bullish sediment, uh, yeah, it, it feels like we're not just going to hit all time highs this week. It feels like we're going to break those all time highs. Well, I I think the debate really is: Are we going to hit it today, not this week? Quite frankly, um, you know, because you're 18 points off, Matt. That is on a 2,800 point index. That's about two thirds of a percent. The market would have to rally you know, through nicely through the day, you'd have to pick up and run. I, I think if you gave me an over under, you gave me a probability odds, you had to set a line. I don't know if we're going to get there today, but uh, it could. Uh, no, it, it, I, I would be a little surprised if it got there today, Tim. There's not a lot of economic news this week in the market uh, until later, really. Um, you know, the central banks are come, kind of coming through from last week. Uh, economics, not a lot. You got you got some earnings reports later on today with Snapchat, Disney, Match.com, and whatnot. But I don't I don't see anything that is, that that could happen in the market that really kind of drives it. 
looking at it from an intraday perspective, we're looking at a 15 minute chart here and the market open right here, you can see price appreciation fairly aggressively at the first hour, hour and a half of the market. But ever since then, we've kind of just stagnated here. Mm -hmm. now, I expect this to stagnate for the next hour or so, kind of just in that lull of the halftime report, people are eating, not really paying attention, not a lot of price action going on. It certainly could pick up towards the end of the trading, uh, end of the trading day, that last 30 minutes, last hour. Sometimes we'll see a ramp coming up into that last hour of the trading day. But uh, as of right now, you know, the market, I think the market's done most of its movement it's had today, at least up until the close. I would think you would have to have extremely bullish sediment coming in today to have it reach that all time high. I just don't think it's going to happen today. I'll take the over. Why not? Okay, we're two thirds of a percent up uh, away from it. And that would be a 1% day on the market. That's not like a crazy day. Uh, I think that you're going to have to give me odds. Like I'll buy you a burger if it doesn't. You have to buy me a steak dinner if it does. Sound good? It's a fair bet. Come well, on. So I get 28.75. Let me get this right. So here, here's, here's, here's the bet. I get 28.78.5. It's got to hit it, not close above it. Oh, now you're throwing caveats out there. Okay. Well, you're, probability you're throwing, of touching, not probability of expiration, all right? Now you sounded yeah. very confident until <laughs> I put it out there. 2875, if it doesn't hit it, I get a burger. If it does hit it, you get a steak dinner. All right, I'll take those odds. Sounds good. All right, uh, I like it. By the way, there's a lot of really great burgers out there, but I'm going to enjoy that steak if it does hit it. Uh, throughout the market, though, the ES is not the strongest one, in my opinion, right now. I, I like what tech is doing. I also like, you know, some of the other sectors in the market, Matt. This one is a different pattern, though. You know, tech is up 0.38%. It's had a nice retracement rally. If you're a swing trader and you're hitting an approaching 75.30 here, and you're within shouting distance of the high. Do you take profits on some tech trades here? I think so. I, I mean, you're, I, I don't necessarily believe you're slowing down coming into resistance here. You're still got some wide body candles showing strength coming up. RSI still shows strength moving up, passed up above 50. The NASDAQ is actually trailing the S&P right now with the S&P actually breaking out of those resistance levels on the way to the all-time high. The NASDAQ's been hitting all-time highs all along the way here. NASDAQ's been extremely strong from a trend perspective. The best trend out there in the market right now is the is the NASDAQ. It's, it's, it's got more of a consistent trend than almost any other stock out there right now. Higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, higher high, higher lows. It's been very consistent. But just from a from a from you know what index today, I mean the SP breaking out today versus the NASDAQ, although I will tell you. A close above 7,500 on the NASDAQ, extremely bullish in my estimation. There's so many stocks, CRM, you know, Baidu, all of these different companies I've been watching today that are in tech, some of them stronger, some of them weaker. But one of my favorite on the NASDAQ, we're going to talk about it later in the show, Matt, is Google. What a beautiful pivot trigger, swing trade setup. Also has got some news on it today. I'm with you. I love tech. I would take profit here when it's hitting a high point in some level. Could just be a scale out, Matt. You know, could be, you know, if you've got a bunch of contracts, take a few of them off. Or if you have long calls, turn it into a spread. There's a lot of different things you can do with that. Let's move on to. I, I, I will say this, though, Tim, on that point, you know, obviously scaling out a resistance point, a very standard principle. But this market just it just it's it's really bullish right now, Tim. Oh, I wouldn't scale out of everything. I mean, you have yeah, to you have to play strength. I'm not I'm not taking profits completely off the table, and I am continuing. Here's the thing, Matt. We're at a high point, all time high in the market, and I have a bullish delta, and I'm not coming off that delta. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just period. I I'm not. I did about a 30 minute reaction video the other day. It's on our YouTube channel today. I put it up there today. Uh, where a student sent me an email asking for help, and he may, was making one of the most common mistakes I've seen for years. The market's bullish. In his email, he said it was bullish. In his screenshots, he called it bullish, but he was looking for everything bearish, Matt. Yeah, it's contrarian. You know, it's 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 that contrarian mindset that uh, we've seen with uh, you know new traders, veteran traders alike. You, you know, we 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 start to think we start to see things from a charting perspective, and we start playing contrarian. And the simple reality is. You're, you know, the, the, the trader who sent you that email, his money, her money doesn't move the marketplace. Mm. Right? 
uh, your money, Tim, my money, you know, Cody's money, everybody, everybody here watching this and watching this on replay today, their money doesn't move the market. Uh, Goldman Sachs money, JP Morgan money, central bank money, that institutional money, uh, hedge fund money, that, that money moves the market. We have to be followers of the marketplace. We can't play contrarian. The reason, the reason technical analysis works in the first place is not because of some you know, hypothetical situation from 500 years ago where somebody created a mathematical, you know, Fibonacci. I had to throw the Fibonacci in there for you today, Tim. <laughs> but, uh, but, but no, the reason technical analysis works is because people use it and it's because people follow it. And because the, 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 it's almost like this self-fulfilled prophecy for, uh, for, you know, for example, looking at the S and P 500 today, Tim, you and I are not the only ones sitting here looking at the, the, the breakout yesterday and the follow through today on the S&P 500. Wall Street's looking at that. Uh, institutions are looking at that. Hedge funds are looking at that. And they're, and they're all seeing that as a technical formation called the breakout. And they're like, okay, breakouts have high probability of continuing. Let's go ahead and buy that breakout versus the contrarian say, well, it's too high. Let me play, let, let me play the fade back down to the downside. And then they just constantly get just beat up uh, along the way. Follow the market. You know, in, in life, Tim, you want to be a leader. You do. You want to be a leader of men. And, and, but in the marketplace, you want to be a follower. You want to watch the price action, follow the price action. And you never want to get to the point where you say, oh, it's too high. It's going up too long, right? It, it's No, it's high for a reason. It, it's, it, it's low for a reason. You don't want to play the contrarian. If you want to play reversals, then learn reversals. But right now in the marketplace, we're not seeing anything in, in anything remotely that looks like a reversal pattern outside the Russell 2000. Trading Zen. I mean, it is what it is. You have to accept and embrace the information in front of you and follow it. There's no doubt about it. Uh, when you get too tricky, when you get too, uh, you know, predictive about what may or may not happen, try to counter trend trade. I mean, that, that's when it gets difficult. Uh, let's move on to the Dow and the RTY and kind of talk about those two indexes as well. Uh, it, you know, the Dow Jones Industrial has been one of those areas you've been bullish on, Matt. It's a beautiful breakout, maybe the best signal today. Yeah, uh, Dow certainly is showing strength there, breaking out of a high, what I would consider a high base type situation. The, the index today up over a half percent, showing strength at the top end of its range right here. Looking at, <clears throat> looking at it potentially from the rest of the trading day, Tim, if I'm looking at this intraday and I'm saying, okay, which one of these indexes are showing me the best, uh, best opportunity in the short term, you're looking at a short term intraday high base type situation on the, on the uh, Dow Jones. That is just basically simple consolidation in a bullish uptrend versus the S&P 500 showing a little bit of the same type pattern versus the uh, looking at the NASDAQ here. Just give me one second. Let me find the NASDAQ showing a little bit more volatility from an intraday perspective than the, than the actual Dow is. I love the Dow here breaking out of that high base. I love the price action we're seeing today. Uh, you know, it, it's it's something that, you know, as the market has been higher and higher and higher, Tim, I, something I've noticed, and I don't know if this is actually, and I want to get your take on it, but but these price movements, we have to start maybe adjusting what a big move in the market is. You know, I remember back in 2011 when volatility hit with the European debt crisis, a big movement in the market was 2 3 4% on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But that's when the market was lower than it is today. A big movement in the market right now. We have a quite a big candle here, but only up slightly over 0.5%. I would still say that is a fairly sizable movement in the market, showing strength coming up above its resistance uh, resistance levels. The next key level of resistance for the Dow Jones is 28, uh, 25,000. I would say 25,800 is where I'd kind of put that level. All-time high at 26,684. That's not going to be hit for uh, for quite a little bit, I would say. Certainly, the S&P 500 has an opportunity to hit that all-time high. I definitely believe it will do it this week. Uh, and the NASDAQ is just so in strength. I mean, we're seeing strength across the board, Tim, in the markets today, even with the Russell 2000, only up about 0.38%, but still showing some strength, increasing support levels still. The Russell is definitely the weakest of the bunch. It has a neutral rating versus the other indexes, both a positive one. Yeah, I mean, what is a big move is a good question. 
I'm with you. I mean, I've done some studies and uh, historical analysis on how many days a year are over 2%, 3% and all that kind of stuff. And there's, there is a bell-shaped curve of distribution. Now, by the way, the tails are very off though, because there are more big moves on the downside than there are big moves on the upside. Mm -hmm. It's the nature of how markets work. You know, it goes back to that old saying, bulls take the stairs and bears take the elevator. So for an upside move, is 1% a big day? I would say so. I don't, yeah, maybe. I would say so. During the summer in August, you know, the, the dog days of summer. Yeah, I, I think so. There's money to be made, by the way, in 1% move. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of upside. Move in the market today means more money than a 2.8% movement in the market 10 years ago. Okay, in terms of total dollar figures, the market's massive, much larger today than it was 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, you know, after the drop of the subprime market crash, 1% movement in the S&P 500 represented, you know, right about seven points, right? Are we can have another math fight. No, I, a 1% movement in the Dow, or excuse me, the S&P at 700 is a seven point movement. A one percent movement in the in the in, you know S and P five hundred at twenty eight sixty two is twenty eight points. Well, yeah, but I, I get it. I, yeah, right. it I'll table be, it. I'll leave it. it. I have a thought there, but I'll leave it. It is. Oh, keep going. I want to hear. Well, it. here's my thing. Like that's like saying a two percent rise in wages is um, more than a fifty percent rise in wages a hundred years ago because they were only making thirty cents an hour. So now a two percent rise on hundred thousand a year is two thousand a year, where they didn't even make that before. So it's all oh, relative. Okay, that's fine. But a 1% rise in wages 40 years ago is the exact same 1% rise in wages as it is today. So I don't see the commonality. No, I'm saying I, it's neither here nor there. <laughs> it is where I say, say lobby. <laughs> all, right. all right. Okay. So 1% is a big enough move. Maybe it's a medium move. I don't know. It's substantial. I'll tell you this, Matt. Whenever I go into the market and I see 1%, which we're not quite there yet on the Dow today, we're about 0.7%. Mm -hmm. Whenever I go into the market and see 1%, I know it's a substantial day, especially to the upside. Now, any trader who's been around long term, though, knows that when you go down, you can hit 2%, 3% a lot. Oh, easy. easy. Right. You know, substantially mm -hmm. bullish today. There's no doubt about it. I, I think the story of the day, though, Matt, is crude oil. Uh, there's so many things going on with crude oil. News out of Brazil, news out of Venezuela, news out of Iran, global news all over the place, uh, potential impacts. But from a charting perspective... It just cannot break 70. It can do it. will it. not break and hold. And so who knows? I mean, uh, I've not touched it yet. You still in this position? What do you got here? Yeah, I'm still in the position. <clears throat> I, I got out of the um, the uh, XLRE position yesterday. Um, and, you know, as I was kind of looking at the uh, tail end of the market, I uh, decided to kind of just get out of that position and replay it. Uh, down the road. But this crude oil trade, I'm still in the crude oil trade. You know, I woke up today, I checked all the news before I even looked at the chart, before I even looked at the price movements. You know, I'm just, you know, kind of my own routine. I check Twitter, I'm looking at the news of the day, I, you know, go through my morning routine. And Tim, I expected like just in, and I don't know if I was dreaming last night about this and it broke out of 70. I think I did dream about crude oil breaking out of 70, by the way, last night. So I was a little confused this morning when it didn't break out of 70 on the news that it should have broken out of 70. I mean, yes, we did know we were going to replace sanctions on Iran. You know, maybe we didn't know we were looking at November to, to do even further sanctions on Iran. But all the news in the world wanted crude oil to kind of, you would think crude oil would break 70. It didn't do it. It hit that intraday level 70 that we've been talking about. And it just can't break it. I'll tell you, though, I still like it. I still like it right now. Could end up burning me, um, but I'm still going to stay into the trade. Yeah, I'm waiting. I've been waiting, literally been waiting and watching this thing for a couple of weeks. And uh, I don't know. I, I got to get confirmation now. It, it is. Well, you tell I, me, I, I'm break even right now on the trade. Okay. I, it, the, it's went up a little I like bit. This. I've lost a little bit on theta, right? So, so I'm break even on the trade right now. You tell me as your trading partner over the last 13 years, knowing me very, very well, in your estimation, am I emotional about this trade right now because I'm so stuck on the crude trade breaking 70? Well, you're no more stubborn about this than you are everything else in your life. Sure. So, sure. I mean, I have to I have to measure that relative to the, the general nature of it. 
no, I don't think you're emotional. I mean, you evaluate it every day. We look at it. I'm not seeing any emotion of it here. I love the question though, because it really gets down to something I've done in mentorship many, many times. And whenever I, I talk to a trader who's in a difficult position, I ask them, if you could start it today, would you take the position right now at a break even? Okay. So it, this is even particularly more helpful when somebody's losing and people get stuck on their trade, they're down money, the stock is going down, 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 or whatever it is. And I'll just ask him, if you could start it all this moment with the exact same risk profile, reward and risk, and wipe out any history you had, would you take that trade today? So Matt, there's a question. Would you go long on crude at that moment right now? No. So maybe you are emotional about if it. This, if this was a new trade that I was analyzing today, and I'm, and I'm sitting at 69.19 instead of 68 when I made the trade. And I'm sitting at 69.19. And now I see all this evidence at $70. It's a better trade to wait for a close above $70. Yeah. That is. Now, if I close out of my position right now, you know, like I said, I'm about break even right now. If I close out of the trade right now and it ultimately breaks out of 70, I'm going to lose a little bit on the, uh, on the return but I'm going to have less risk and a higher probability. I think it's better to set, to reset the trade above $70. Well, I mean, and you can't do that every single minute of every single day. You would be overthinking it. There is a stars and moon fallacy no, as well yeah. here, right? But I, I like the exercise of having to kind of force yourself to examine, is this a good entry at this point? You know, uh, you have a trading plan. You're not emotional. Your money management is in line. I think a reset above 70 would be better, but Matt, then it comes down to the question, why not just add to the position above 70? Well, I'm already hedged because I sold call options against it, right? So I'm already hedged in the bull call spread. But but when I'm looking at this, Tim, you made an interesting point and say, well, yeah, I mean, if there was just, you know, one time it hits 70, you're not going to freak out about that. And I said that last week as it hit 70 for the first time, I said, okay, I'm not going to freak out just because it slowed down at 70. But now as, as the evidence is building, right? It's like a court case. The evidence is building, right? It's like, uh, are, you, are you staying on top of that uh, Paul Manafort court case, Tim? No. The evidence is building. I'm just going to say that. The evidence is building at $70 that will lead to a conclusion. And as you can see, over the last nine trading days, okay, since we first initially uh, nailed that $70 mark as the intraday resistance level here on 726, it hit 70, hit 70, hit 70, hit 70, hit 70. Five out of the last nine trading days, it has hit 70 on an intraday perspective. Cannot, it has, has not been able to break that even on positive news, okay? So when I'm looking at this, I'm saying, okay, back here, no, that, that's a different analysis. But now I have all this other analysis that leads to $70 being a fairly important intraday resistance level. If it breaks out of that, you should see price appreciation fairly aggressively back up. But to me, it's a 50-50 coin flip that, that 70 gets broken this week. Yeah. I want somebody in the chat to type this in. Buy on strength, sell on weakness. It's really the philosophy of what we're talking about here and trade with your eyes. I agree. 70 is clearly building as uh, evidence in this court case you know, that the market is constantly having with itself. Uh, I don't know. I, I like the idea of either buying in or building on this position above 70, Matt. You know, which would be to buy back your short call, open up the risk graph and do something with that position. But you've got your system. I mean, I don't think you're emotional. Going well, back to the original question. I don't think I'm emotional, but uh, but sometimes you, you can get attached. You know what I mean? So and especially when <laughs> when you're in shows like this and you're looking at positions and whatnot and potential positions, sometimes you can get attached to not just the, the emotion of the money, but being right. You know, you want to be right on your projections and, and all of this. So, I, I, so I'm not emotional, but at the same time, I still believe in the bull side case, right? I still believe in the bull side case on oil right now. And so, because, and I'm talking in the short term, I always believe in the bull side case on the long term on commodities. But in the short term, I do believe in the bull side case. It's just that $70 had made, has, made such, has made such a uh, uh, an impact on that intraday chart that the traders are now looking at that level saying, well, I'm not going to touch this below uh, below 70. Let me wait till it breaks out of 70. And that's kind of what I'm looking at too. 
Yeah, let's move on to gold. By the way, I'd rather be profitable than right any day of the week. Oh, of uh, course. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, no doubt about that. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to gold. And, uh, and by and the talk- way, I wasn't all I was suggesting <laughs> is sometimes you can get emotion because you want to be right or you want to make money or you don't want to lose money. There's a lot of different emotions that we go through as traders. You've got to learn how to control that emotion through looking at the chart. And that's what we're trying to do here is we're just trying to look at the chart, making decisions on where we're going to buy versus when we're going to sell. But I love what you said, buying the strength, selling the weakness. No doubt about that. And talking about selling into weakness, let's go take a look at the gold market. Now, I know that it's going to be back and forth and all that kind of stuff. The GC contract is the one we're looking for. And... Matt, this one's just in a downtrend. I, I, you know, you have green, red, green, red, red, green, red, green, red, green, red. I mean, it's literally back and forth on a day-by-day basis, but generally still fading down. I'm still bearish on these candlesticks. I Even today's candle, there's nothing there. We are developing a pretty key support zone down here. Now, this might be an intraday trigger, but like you were talking about with crude oil, the evidence is building. There's a swing trade set up on a low base that if it blows through that, I think you've got a $1,200 target. Now, is the reward to risk there to try to catch 15 points on goal? Or is it a pass? For me, it's a pass. For me, it's a pass. But I could, you could probably set up a trade on a short gold position where you have a positive reward, a positive two to one reward to risk ratio. Your, your, your support level right now, we had indicated that at 1220 for, for you know, about a week ago, 1220 was the support level. I currently have that support level at 1215, like you were talking about, or, you know, when we were talking about the evidence kind of building here, looking at this test down, the low base right here is right at 1215 and close underneath 1215. You know, you could definitely look at a potential short underneath 1215 with stop loss above 1220. Um, but but you're you're right close to a one a, a two to one reward to risk ratio if your target is 1200. Say you trigger in underneath the lows at 1213. You got a 13 point target with a seven point uh, seven eight point stop loss. To me, I, I just don't think the re- return justifies the risk. Yeah, R to R is pretty tough on this one. I mean, uh, you'd have to get pretty pretty creative. And whenever I have to kind of box something in that tight, I don't know. I, I I'm bearish on gold. There's no doubt about it. I kind of just don't like the numbers from a trigger, you know, target stop type of perspective. Let's uh, take a look at. And and Tim, this uh, trajectory from this price moving to this price, it is trend is slowing down as well. So, you know, if you're bearish on, I think the best you can get is a negative one bearish mentality right now. And when you're a negative one versus a negative two, that does determine kind of strategy selection, Tim. If I'm negative one on something, I'm looking to be a little bit more conservative on the trade setup and the trade strategy than if I'm a negative two. If I'm a negative two, I'll go out there and pop put options, short the stock, be a little more aggressive with the with the entry and the reward versus risk. But something that is slowing down here in my estimation, you got to come off that throttle. And to me, there's there's really not a great trade here with uh, with the reward to risk ratio and a negative one bias. You know, uh, most important indicator to look at every day is the VIX. Let's go ahead and take a peek at that right now. VIX. By the way, I feel validated on Twitter. I put on a, a thing, and one of our mentors, a man that both of I both of us know, is a great trader. He said he sells credit spreads on this at 52 weeks a year. He's yeah, a trading system. Yeah. And you know what? I was going to say to that. I was going to say, you know, there were other hedge funds doing that in February. In February, they were short VIX, short VIX, and when the VIX exploded in February, uh, they lost their entire hedge fund, hundreds of millions of dollars. So, yeah, short VIX, short VIX, short VIX. You better hedge it though. Well, that's what a natural spread is, though. I mean, if you think about it, they were short naked calls on it oh, yeah. and, and they got wiped out. If you do it as a spread, a bear call, you know, vertical type spread, but, you have limited set. What he was talking about was vastly different than what you and I were talking about. Hey, hey baby, listen, I, I'm just saying we had confirmation that other people do like it. By the way, our, our poll on Twitter, there's only one vote that says they don't use the VIX. And I'm trying to guess who that might be. Well, that's me. I know that. Yeah, that's uh, is, again, you, we had this conversation with Keith yesterday, you know, in the podcast. Neither one of you actually told me anything that you actually use the VIX for. I no, nobody has actually told me something they use the actually use the VIX for as an indicator. 
I use it for daily poetry uh, readings, Matt. You, I, do it, you do it just to drive me nuts every day. We've talked enough about the VIX. It's very, right, moving on. You're reading here on the VIX. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So listen, it's at a low point. You've got a doji. It's probably going to have a, a backfill rally, but Matt, for years, it's just been fading. There's nothing to see here. You got the month of August. Now, by the way, what it does tell me is that it's not a bad time to start pricing straddles uh, for earnings in September and early October. You know what else tells you? You know what else tells you that? The you calendar. Know, like, you do. I got gotcha. you. I know. But it's just a quick indicator. Moving on. All right. We will have to have people listen to the podcast. We spend quite a bit of time on that, debating that. And I do appreciate Captain Goat that you did uh, listen to that podcast from this week. I enjoyed that one quite a bit. Let's move on to some of the stocks I've got uh, on my radar here today, Matt. Check out Google first off. Google had news coming out saying they were going to try to go back into China. Now, they've failed at that in the past. And Baidu, they immediately made a press release saying, listen, come on over. You know, we beat you before. We're going to beat you again. Google is showing incredible strength today after a good pullback pivot. I love this entry point. I put it on Twitter. I long this position just fair, you know, to everybody out there. What are you, what are you seeing here with Google? I, I, I'm seeing you traded at bulk all spread. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yep. It, it, it's a great setup here, Tim, no doubt about that. You know, when we were talking about in the pre-production uh, for uh, the halftime report today, we were looking at, you You brought up Google in re reference to Baidu, and then that led up you and I to have a conversation on China versus the U.S., a similar conversation that we had on the podcast yesterday. And I just want to throw it out to the group. It, you know, you did, it, it, and if you haven't listened to the podcast from yesterday, definitely do that. But we had a discussion and we threw it out to Keith, myself and, and Tim. If you had a look at China or the U.S. over the next 10 years, where would you go? Right. And, and, and there's certainly the bull case for China, no doubt about that. But that led to us having a conversation on how these tariffs discussions, how it really hasn't impacted the U.S. markets, Tim. If you look at the U.S. market since the tariff discussion really started in February here, the U.S. markets initially sold off here, but overall has shown tremendous strength coming out of the tariff discussion. If you look at it on the NASDAQ here, here's kind of when the tariff discussion happened initially. After that initial movement of only two to three weeks, the NASDAQ has formed just an absolutely amazing, beautiful trend here. You, you compare that against the Chinese markets here. Here's that same tariff discussion, Tim. Starting right here, here's that same sell-off we saw in the S&P 500. But then over the course of the next four, five, six months, you've seen the Chinese markets get hit really, really hard. Now, looking at a few Chinese stocks in comparison to Google here, but looking at a few Chinese stocks on the U.S. markets. Well, I'll, I'll do you one better. Baba, Baidu, all of them for sure. Okay, we'll look at all of them. Bob, yeah, go, go to Finviz. Go to Finviz for me. Hold Let's on. Go. I'm not going to fit this. Well, you okay. can click in Baba and then you can look at all the major mega cap Chinese companies in the same shoot. Yeah, hey, that's fantastic. But in terms of this, though, let's look at the chart on each one of these very quickly. Sure. Looking at Baba here, at best, sideways neutrality at the low points. It's basically on the year. It's down on the year on Baba. Looking at the VIPs, not the Baba VIPs, looking at the VIPs here. Okay, February here, the VIPs is doing absolutely outstanding, Tim. We were looking at this stock, putting it on the tackle 25. It was doing absolutely amazing. Tariff discussion comes out, VIPs get chopped in half in the next six months. You look at uh, you look at uh, Tencent, which just made a deal with uh, <clears throat> with, uh, with Google, actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Tencent here, tariff discussion comes out. As you see, markets just getting absolutely tank, uh, absolutely tanked down about thirty uh, percent since that tariff discussion. And then looking at kind of Google's competitor, not Baidu, uh, Baidu here. Okay, looking at Baidu tariff discussion, initial price movement looks very similar to Baba. So when you're looking at ten cent Baba, you're looking at the Bips, you're looking at uh, Baidu. All Chinese stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange. All of them, despite the market showing tremendous strength coming out of that tariff discussion, they are showing tremendous weakness. Looking at the overall Chinese marketplace here, showing tremendous weakness over the course of the last six months, really in that tariff discussion. 
And then I come back to the, U the US markets here and I'm seeing this type of price action, very consistent trend lines going still back up and coming back over to Google, coming into China. Look at this showing tremendous strength. And so when I'm looking at kind of this overall tariff discussion, <clears throat> you know, the Chinese stock market and the Chinese stock trade on the US markets have shown tremendous weakness ever since the tariff discussion and trade wars started happening. US markets are still showing strength. So I'm going to throw it out to the group here. If you had to pick something over the next 10 years, let's play the same game we played on the podcast. If you had to pick something and you said, you know what, give me the US markets over the next 10 years or give me the Chinese markets over the next 10 years, which one are you going to go with? Locked in. Tim, locked in. Which one are you going to go with? Hmm. That's a really tough call. Not for me. Yeah, I, I think China's going to make more money over ten year period. Personally, I, I, I um, they're not going to make more money than Google, Microsoft, Facebook, those tech companies out Silicon Valley too. They're not going to make more money than Amazon. I don't know. I think it's a tougher call than uh, what you're saying. I mean, you've got regulation. You also got like this. Then. Take the country of origin out of it. I will give you. Baidu, Tencent, Vips, and Baba. You give me Google, Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon. Well, it's not just those four companies, but here's the point. Yeah, and again, you're not picking four companies. You're market. picking you're picking the index, right? You're picking the entire large cap index on both. So the S and P 500 versus the FXI. You know, yeah. SPY, FXI, SPY versus Tencent. FXI. Um, Hmm. I don't. Have, I don't know. To be honest, I, do. I, I don't know. It, it, for me, it's not even a debate. It, it's S and P. Give me those. Give me those blue chipper stocks out of the S and P. Well, you could button hook any day. I would always just buy the S and P. I have no problem with that. Uh, but if I actually have to try to project and predict who's going to have more growth and make more money over a course of a ten year period. You have a, an emerging economy still at this point. They're growing at faster rates. You have all kinds of potential growth in that region. China still dominates it. They do six, 7% a year, Matt. Now, <clears throat> in the short term, they've been under pressure. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but if I look at the Baidu, the Baba, the all of those different companies, I mean, I'm looking in Tencent. These are, Matt, I, I don't know. I, I, I probably would take China. If you're giving me 10 years and you're giving me yeah. growth, I would probably take China. Yeah. Number one, China will grow GDP more than the U.S. will in that yeah. time frame, but they will not make more money. Okay. That's the difference in a 1% on the 600 index versus the 1% on the $25,000 index. Okay. They're different total numbers. Um, it, when I'm looking at the markets here and yeah, I'm bullish on China over the next 10 years as well. I'm bullish on the U S markets over the next 10 years, but I just look at some of those biggest stocks out there like Apple, Amazon, you know, Google, Microsoft, you know, all these companies coming at uh, Salesforce, Facebook, you know, the oh, yeah, I love them. massive companies out there, Tim. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm going to say I'm taking those over the Chinese stocks. I, I just am. I think they're safer. I think they're, I think they're more, they're, they're more established, more liquid. China has more growth potential from a GD perspective, but the U S markets will st still be the most dominant market 10 years from now. And so I'm going to take the U S markets. Interesting. Uh, well, I mean, we're going to continue to have this debate probably for the next 10 years, quite frankly, because these are the two biggest economies in the world. Now, well, if you ask me to take one currency, uh, the yuan or the dollar, I'd take the dollar in a heartbeat. Oh, not even close. I mean, yeah. there's there's not a currency in the world I would take more than the dollar right now. So, yeah. you know, the do the dollar, you know, king and queen right now. But at the same time, Tim, you look at you look at the Chinese. We've talked about the Chinese growth for a second. I don't believe in the Chinese economic numbers, Tim. Okay, so so when they announce they they're they're growing at seven percent. That includes the fake cities they're building as well. So, so I don't necessarily. So are you saying are you saying that they know how to win math fights because they just make up the numbers? Is that what you're saying? It's easy to win a math fight when you make up numbers. Yes. I, I, yes. I'm moving on. Go on to the dollar. By the way, speaking of uh, the currency markets, uh, the dollar is now banging resistance and showing some, you know, some weakness here at the high, 95 and a half. Matt, we talked about a breakout. Until we get a breakout, nothing to see here. Uh, let's keep going through some of these stocks. Tonight, we have earnings, Matt. Disney has earnings tonight. Now, the expectation on Disney, you've got a large cap company. 
huge company, obviously. Uh, they're expected to, to come in and beat like they always have. I think they beat like 12 quarters in a row or some crazy number like that. You're not going to get a big movement. Uh, what's the MMM on this one, by the way? We're at 117 mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, Disney's a very, very established, very blue chip type company. Uh, you're looking at a projected five point movement on 117. So you're looking at right around 4% projected movement here, Tim. Yeah. A little higher than, than I'm typically expecting on a Disney. Disney typically moves in that two to three point, uh, two to three percent range. This is expected to move at a five point range. You know, with, with Disney typically not moving that much on earnings, you could look at a potential short strangle here. Volatility is a little higher on, on, on Disney in comparison to what it usually is. No, I like it. Volatility is very, very high right now with implied volatility. Options are going to be priced to sell here, no doubt about that. Disney doesn't move a tremendous amount on earnings. You know, short strangle, if you can make the numbers work, does make some sense. Uh, I do believe that the implied movement is based on the fact that Disney's been up about 20% in the last two months alone. Investors are looking for a rock star report here, Tim. Yeah, you know, the, the short strangle makes more sense. By the way, when I do naked strangle, I prefer mega cap companies, you know, that don't have high PE multiples. Disney is a qualified candidate for the way that I do naked strangles and short strangles. And part of it is, Matt, I like the size in the company because then they don't tend to jump around as much. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we're going to do it, not, wouldn't do the 10 day option on short. Uh, let's go out 45 days. Make a move. Now, again, we're going to do a 10 day option here just to take advantage of the volatility crush here. Uh, looking at that, whenever I'm looking at a short strangle, Tim, and a short strangle is basically I'm selling a deep out of the money call option. I'm selling a deep out of the money put option. And as long as it stays within that range, we're going to be profitable on the trade. So with the market maker move expected to be five points, we want to sell at least twice that market making move, which is a 10 point range from the current stock. Current stock is 117. I'm going to come down to this 11 delta at the 107, uh, 107 put option. And then I'm going to go do the 127, 127. See what that delta is. Okay, 127 is a 12 delta. So you tell me if this is a good trade, Tim. I'm selling twice the market making moves, 11 and 12 deltas. I'm getting an 88 cent, con uh, 88 cent con uh, uh, credit per contract. Buying power is 1,346. I'm not getting it. I don't think that you're getting the ROI on that. If I was going to do it, Matt, I would probably go to September, October. By yeah, the way. Yeah, 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 now that you have to. I mean, you, now you can go out to September with, say, the 105. Well, and this is what traders do, guys. They just price in different expiration dates until they find a trade that makes the most sense for them. 130. So I can get a little bit more range here, T, with the 105 by 130. I'm getting a buck 18 on the credit, getting about 10% ROI on that. Well, now, now here's the thing. Delta. I think it's really important uh, to kind of clarify one thing. You're not going for 10 or 11%. We've talked about this on the halftime. No, report. you're going for. Two, two, three percent max. I mean, really, you would build this trade to try to make one or two percent after commissions, you, you know, but that's only in like one to two days. You know, you're not holding it on for a long position, but uh, you're you're taking on risk. And by the way, you could take a four or five percent hit on that. There's an inverted reward to risk ratio with naked strangles. Now, the, the September, the October, I think in October, Matt, you could do the hundred one thirty five, get tons of cushion and probably pick up one percent. But the further you go out in time, obviously, the less impact you're going to have from the volatility crush. Now, this is a confusing thing for some traders. Vega is higher on the October mat, but read the implied volatility percentage for August 10 day and the October. 40% versus 23%. So the Vega will be higher on October. So the math geeks are going to say, oh, well, Vega is higher. But yeah, but you're coming from a lower percentage. So mm -hmm. the October options are only going to drop like two or three percent implied volatility, where the August options will drop ten percent implied volatility most likely. So it's well, kind of a debate. It's a debate. It, it is. I mean, you're looking at range versus probability versus uh, projected ROI. You know, obviously, I would rather. And Cody, did I lose Matt's audio for one second? I'm just going to start talking, assuming I did. Hey guys, I did too. Yeah. So we lost your audio there for a minute. So guys, 
Naked strangle, by the way, is one of my favorite strategies. Now, it's an advanced strategy because you have the call option and the put option and you're short on both sides. OK, uh, something like Disney, where you're not going for a lot of return, is a great way to play it. But at the end of the day, you're not going for the whole trade. Uh, you're not going to go for a 45 or a 75 day trade. You're using those options if you simply prefer to have the cushion and the safety from time. Right, because then that allows you to open up your window a little bit more. Does that make sense? Very good, Jake. Hey, Jake, good to see you, bud. And Matt, let me know if your audio is there or did we lose Matt? We lost him for a second. Okay. By the way, other stocks that have earnings tonight, and somebody put these in the chat for me Snapchat, S N A P. So we had Disney, Snapchat. Match.com, which is MTCH. Now, those two companies, I think, are better candidates for the inverted butterfly, which is that bi-directional kind of trade where you're looking for a big move up or a big move down. Okay. Now, tomorrow morning, there's CVS, Southern Company, uh, but there's a couple that I'm really paying attention to that I like. Now, uh, I like New York Times and the Sinclair Broadcasting Group. The media fights that have been happening lately, I think you're gonna get some volatility in there, but the inverted flies on Snapchat and Match will be uh, things we do price. Now, Matt, I think I've got you back. Yep. Welcome back, brother. So on Disney, here's the thing, Matt, you know, it's not a sexy trade, you know, but you can no. get cushion and you could go for one or 2%. You know, that that is naked strangle trading, by the way. And if I was gonna give anybody advice on naked strangles, don't chase the ROI. Because if you ran the numbers on Snapchat, Matt, I guarantee Snapchat would have more money in it. It's not even gonna be close. I mean, you could do the same 10 day trade, same Delta, and this ROI is gonna explode, but it doesn't make it the better trade, right? Well, I mean, yes, the volatility is definitely higher on Snapchat than Disney. Snapchat is an illiquid company. Disney is a very blue chip established, very liquid company. Uh, you're looking you're looking at a projected, you know, 4% movement on Disney. You're looking at a projected. And Maddie, let me stop you for a second. Just as yep. we're coming back, give a drop your screen, bring it back. I think. Uh, mm hmm. Yeah, here we are. Looking good. Well, so, maybe. So what I was saying was you're just looking at two completely different companies here. So if you're project, if you're looking at a short string on Disney and you're comparing the numbers in Snapchat, yeah, I can go with these 10 day numbers on Snapchat, go that same uh, 10 delta there, right click sell, strangle, go down to the 11 delta there on the $18 call option. I have an eight point range. I'm selling about twice the, uh, twice the market maker move. I'm getting 32 cents credit on, you know, $134 in buying power. You're looking at right around a 28% projected ROI versus- Right, that. right. So 10%. stop for a second. And that, this is the important point. Disney was 10%, Snapchat's 32%, okay? But it doesn't make Snapchat a better trade. No, it, Snapchat has more risk. Chat, Snapchat's a worse trade in my opinion, okay? I would take the short strangle on Disney, possibly. I, I don't like it. It's not a sexy trade. I'm not going to take that trade. I would not naked strangle Snapchat. There's no I, chance. Not going to happen. I don't care what the range is, Tim. Ain't going to do it. Nope. I, I do not care what the range is. The, to me, I'm expecting price movement here. You look at this chart, Snapchat's last earnings, 14 all the way down to 11, a three-point movement to the downside, dropped about 25%. 14 all the way up to 16 and a half, traded up to 21 on the next day. You're, you're, you're looking at massive volatility swings on Snapchat. You know, this is a company that's on my I hate list. And there's mm -hmm. there's no way I'm trading a short strangle on a company that I can't stand like this. Looking at that, though, from an inverted butterfly perspective might make some sense if you can get the if you can get the numbers to to pan out. But for me, I'm probably staying away from uh, Snapchat and Disney tonight. Well, you know, and I was talking about it and uh, you have to go back and look at the historical gaps and all that kind of stuff. It's possible, Matt, and I rarely, hardly ever do this, but I might actually go just long straddle on Snapchat. Uh, I'm expecting volatility craziness. I mean, that's that's my expectation. The company jumps two, three bucks, you know, as it 
pretty much all the time. It's all over the place. So uh, last time we got from 14 down to 11, you know, I definitely believe it's going to get, it's going to move more than the market. I, I, I do believe that straddles can work in that capacity, Tim, but you know, it, when you're looking at this and this is the only disclaimer I'm going to put on this, on that strap, that long straddle play, volatility is very high on Snapchat right now. Options are priced to sell, not priced to buy for with the volatility expected to come back down out of Snapchat fairly aggressively, Tim, you're going to need this stock in the next day or two to move, to move much more than the market expects for you to be profitable on that trade. Well, at two and a half points, that would put you down at what, 11. So if you bought the 11 <clears throat> straddle, $37, 37 cents, and you bought the 15 and a half, that'd be about the, the MMM move. I would not do, you know what I mean? So if you're doing the 15 and a half call and the 11 put, it's a low probability trade. I got to tell you, you're probably only going to be correct on that, that kind of position, maybe 20% of the time. Most likely you are going to lose money on this position. Okay. But if, if you caught some crazy upside move map, it is a high reward type of scenario. Again, it's not a core strategy for me. I hardly ever do them for a reason. You don't want to be buying options into earnings hardly ever, but Snapchat is just a crazy company. Look at the chart. You know, if you look at the gapping on that chart, It's, it's nuts. I mean, it literally is nuts. Uh, I, I know, but the, it's priced to be nuts. You know what I mean? And it, it's priced to, to gap from 13, 13, two and a half up would be right around here. It's priced to gap there. It's priced to gap here. So, so tomorrow, I mean, it's priced to do something crazy. I expect more than the market making move, which means I do like your long straddle trade. It's just with volatility crushed out of, out of Snapchat, extremely aggressive, you're not going to need a $2.3 movement one way or the other to be profitable on that trade. You're going to need a three, three and a half dollar movement. Mm -hmm. And can you get that on Snapchat? Oh, absolutely. But Tim, at that point, you're talking about a 30% price movement on earnings. Oh, big move. Yeah, I haven't made a decision yet. So I've got, I've got about two and a half hours here left in the day. <laughs> I Let can come. understand it. Yeah, I, I don't know how I'm going to play those two, by the way. I love earnings. You know, Disney, most likely I want to sell volatility. Uh, there is always the Debacon. There's different strategies, inverted flies. I'm looking for something bi-directional on Snapchat. So, you know, interesting. The other one I want to talk about is Match.com, Matt. And uh, swipe right, swipe, swipe left, right? <laughs> That's what it is. This one is a much different kind of company than Snapchat. Snapchat is so bi-directional. Uh, let's evaluate this company's earnings potential map because it was in such a beautiful uptrend for so long. One of the most, you know, strongly performing companies in the marketplace there. Uh, news back in April brought it down. Earnings started to kick it back up. Now we're neutral in a range. What's your take on Match? You know, it's not, it's not a company I'm very familiar with. Not a company I've traded hardly at all. Um, <clears throat> I, when you asked me to evaluate it yesterday, you know, as I, I even had to ask you what's the symbol for it because I just don't trade Match.com very much. So I, I'm not familiar with the fundamentals, the earnings. This is not a company. He's a married man who's been married now for close to 20 years. It's not a company I usually track, to be perfectly honest with you. So, you know, it's... it's I was in, uh, I got to tell you a story. I was in Atlanta uh, a couple months ago and uh, we were doing a pick a stock in a workshop type of deal. Yeah. I, I had a Christian pastor in there and he picked Match.com. And I gave him the hardest time ever. I'm like, yeah. come on, uh, you know, uh, you know, what are you promoting here, right? Tinder. Uh, <laughs> that's, what, that's what we're promoting is Tinder here. Uh, but looking at the company, obviously earnings comes out to here today, uh, today after the market. You're looking at a consensus of 35 cents earnings per share with revenue at about $413 million. Apparently, a lot of people use Match.com and Tinder and whatnot. They have, They're making uh, tons of money. Oh, $413 million in the quarter. That's absolutely astonishing. By the way, uh, to me, Tinder is so fascinating because recently I've had somebody in my life that has gotten single and he keeps telling me about all of, you know, being on Tinder and all that kind of stuff. And he was telling me, Matt, 40% of his Facebook friends are on Tinder. Like, it's got, it's like a I'm social sure, media. I'm sure that's an entirely scientific driven number. <laughs> They're making tons of money. I'll give you the science behind it. Go back to the, go to the fundamentals. Okay. Yeah. This company 
if you come down and you look at EPS uh, per share over time, it's been going up and up and up. In fact, from 2016 to 17, the EPS went from 0.64 to 1.49. Okay, now these are annual numbers year over year. Look at the quarterly. Uh, above the share values, because this is the big one for me, are they making and monetizing all of this activity? I don't know. That's why earnings is so important. Uh, let me it's, ask you a question. It, it, listen, the fundamentals behind the company are not, they're fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's you know, from 2013 to 2016, really kind of neutral stagnation, a little surprised by that with all the free money and quantitative easing. Saw a big jump in earnings per share coming into this year. You're projected at 35 cents a share this quarter. Um, you know, based on that, you're on pace to actually exceed that 1.49 number for 2018. The fundamentals look fine. Yeah. The, I, <clears throat> when I say I don't use the company or I don't know much about the company, that does not mean the company is a bad company, right? It's just that I don't trade it and I don't use the product. So I don't know much about the company. The fundamentals look fine though. Yeah. Do you have any problem buying a company that is supporting uh, all this sin and debauchery? No, of course not. <laughs> it's not my job to judge. Not, not my job either. I, in fact, uh, in fact, I'm Matt a trader. Trump, my job is to make money. Period. End of sentence. A lot of people would say that's worse than you know the the oldest oldest profession in the world. So no, I, I it's not my it's not my job to judge. It's my job to analyze. It's my by job the way. To by the way, time out. Okay. Looking for somebody for a date is not the same as being a prostitute. So the oldest profession in the world line there, it does not necessarily. I didn't say that. I used that. You said that. I didn't say that. You said, do you have a problem? We got to back out of this one. I do not know. Where we're so you, can, you can sit there and try to put that on me all, all you want. I don't care about what who's swiping right, who's swiping left. I don't care who's on match or tender. That doesn't bother me in any capacity. I'm not going to think about that in any capacity. In fact, when my when when you know the people you're talking about and other people when they sit there and talk about it, I don't care it doesn't bother me my job is to read the trend the pattern support resistance analyze return on investments probability and projection that is my job as a trader it is also my job as a trader to remove all emotion from the subject matter and analyze the chart I agree with that all right a uh, qu couple of quick requests from our chat here matt i want to go through them number one is avgo which we were looking at last week and was developing very nicely the market's been strong i uh, have a bear play on this still matt uh, for me i have the bear call our bear put spread like we were looking at i pulled it off today you did you pull this one down okay. i pulled it off this morning um you know there's something here that i do not like this pivot potential here it, it, this to me, I could look at this 10 days from now. And I, and, and what stood out to me here is it would not shock me at all to see this rise back up into this resistance, forming a short-term bullish uptrend. I, I, it, when we put the trade on last week, I love the trade. It was a great trade setup, gap fill projection, downward moving in price, really liked it, pulled it off at a loss today though. Yeah. You know, I'm still in it because there's a couple of reasons. Number one, my account is bullish. And I don't, I have not hit my stop loss point and I've not hit my risk point uh, for several reasons. So there's, it's not like it's gonna whip me, whipsaw me out. And if I take down a bearish position, Matt, what that ends up doing is it moves my Delta more to the positive. No, I and understand. You know what I mean? So sometimes, I mean, I'm just gonna let the trade play out one way or the other. I actually still like it in general. I hate the fact that you're above 220. You know, well, that 220, that. yeah. I can't blame you. I can't blame you. But I, I the only way, because if I start taking down bearish trades right now, just because they're down a little bit, but not hitting my stop, then I just have to hedge my portfolio. It well, opens up a can of worms that I don't I, want to I'm deal with. I'm with you, bro. I'm with you 100%. I totally understand. I took down ABGO. I also took down my short position on, uh, on uh, uh, Morgan Stanley. I nailed the short position right here, looking at it and coming back down. Just don't like that rising 20-day moving average. And so I just wasn't comfortable with kind of the stagnation upward movement in price today. I pulled off Morgan Stanley, pulled off AG, ABGO. I am obviously looking, you know, later on today coming into the close, I'm obviously looking for a couple of bearish positions to offset the Morgan Stanley and ABGO trade that I took off. Take you know, a look. I, took a, I took a small loss on both of those positions, but I'm okay with that. Take a look at Facebook. Quick update on that one. We talked about this one at length yesterday. Uh, Whip sought up to about 180. I don't know what the high was, 187 or so. We're at 185 right now. 
kind of in the same condition we were yesterday. You know, even though it's a red candle, the upward movement is still there. You hit a higher watermark today with the high of that tail. You don't would not love a close on that candle right where it is, Matt. There's no doubt about it. If you're a bull, agree. Well, I mean, we talked about Facebook quite a bit yesterday. Um, I felt like the momentum, I think we were looking at, what was it, about 183 at the time we were looking at it, Tim? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I can give you the exact number here, looking at it from yesterday. So here's yesterday's price moment. We were debating it right there where it was concerned. Oh, uh, right here. About 183. It was kind of base in here. Um, you know, I, I basically say, you know, my argument was if you're, if your projection is Facebook is going to get back up into the 195 to 200 level, you can take a trade at 183 with a stop loss under 180. You know, that 180 mark we talked about last week, this week, you know, all that jazz, that's still a decent reward to risk ratio. I don't mind it here, T. <clears throat> you know, I don't love it, but I don't mind it. I mean, it's coming back down into that, uh, the high base intraday over here showing a little bit of strength right now, kind of stopping this little fade action. I would have to see something start climbing above 185 for me to do anything, but yeah. I'm not gonna make this, I'm not gonna make a trade on Facebook right now. I don't think you can quite frankly uh, at this point, but uh, I mean, maybe if you get an upside movement here intraday and whatnot, you believe in that gap. I, listen, though, but I it's like a no the mask. reward to risk ratio. I, I do. You pick it up at, you know, 185, put a stop loss 179. I'm just throwing out numbers. Those aren't sis. So I'm just giving you roundabout numbers. Uh, you got what about $6 return, $6 risk for, you know, you're looking at upwards of 15 point on the return you know, two to three to one reward to risk ratio somewhere in that. I do like the reward to risk ratio here, Tim. I just don't like the probability. It's, I, I kind of feel like it's a coin flip type scenario right now. Although, it, although I do love the breakout of 180, I just don't feel there's something about it. I don't feel comfortable. There's something, it, maybe it's the, uh, maybe it's all the hoopla and news and controversy around Facebook and, you know, those, those uh, social media companies, big tech companies uh, with the, the Alex Jones news from yesterday with the, you know, I don't want to call it a censorship because I don't believe that's what it was. Um, I believe it's more them applying their internal policies, which I'm perfectly comfortable with. But it, there is controversy surrounding that right now. And, you know, I just don't I, I kind of want to stay away from that from a from a trading perspective. I'm staying away from it as well. You and I discussed enough yesterday. Uh, three things, three quick rapid fire stocks I want to look at. Tesla moving intraday here, Matt. Rarely do you get news like this uh, middle of the day. There was a report out of Saudi Arabia that they've got about $2 billion in their sovereign wealth fund uh, that they're invested into Tesla. Uh, the stock jumped. In fact, go down to a five minute chart real quick. This thing is wanting to hit new highs as well. It happened middle of the morning, which is not generally what you're going to expect from a, from a stock like that. Definitely need to keep an eye on Tesla if it's going to carry through momentum on that. So apparently, Elon Musk isn't done and Tesla isn't bankrupt. Is that what we're oh, saying? Oh, it's funny how things work, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. The news headlines will change. There's no doubt about it. Tesla, uh, there's no doubt. Here's the thing. Resistance up here at the top, you know, and that big candle move. I can't buy into a 6% candle that's random news where that institution or that sovereign hedge fund already own that stock, right? So yeah. it's just, we're, we're now knowing, we're getting the information about what happened, but there's no way I'm chasing that momentum. There's just no chance. Tesla moves up and down with the wind. So I, I, I don't feel, I haven't felt comfortable trading Tesla directionally in years, Tim. I trade right. Tesla quite a bit, but mostly through credit spreads and whatnot. I like selling a lot of range on Tesla, cash flowing on Tesla, but but anybody who wants to pick, pick a, Pick a direction on Tesla. You're better than I am. Yeah, probably. Uh, two quick ones for tomorrow to kind of preview. They are in the morning. I'm not playing either of them tonight, but I'm going to be very fascinated to see what comes out of these two different companies. One is NYT. So the New York Times. I like what the Times has done the last few years, by the way. I, I think that they've done an incredible job as a media outlet, uh, you know, promoting journalism in a fake news world where, and I'm not talking right, left, by the way, I don't no. care about that. Uh, but in a world where we have so much manipulation of media, having a premium company putting out content, I think is a valuable thing, whether it's the Times or somebody else. And so you have one that is conceivably saw as on the left, right? But then you have SBGI, Sinclair Broadcasting Group, B as in Bravo, SBGI. Now, they're only a $2 uh, billion dollar company, the one that is clearly on the right. I'm going to be interested to see if all of this political stuff, everything, everybody always on 
all these new news medias, it, how it translates into profits from these two companies. Earnings are in the morning. Obviously, the time's more established, much bigger. SBGI, $2 billion company, Matt. It's kind of a small cap, uh, but I'm going to be watching them. Any take on these two? Uh, yeah, it doesn't. It, I mean, in the controversy of real news fake news, it seems like uh, the New York Times is uh, not exactly failing since they're in a solid bullish uptrend. Yeah, no, NYT. I mean, well, first of all, they make money, you know, and here's the amazing thing about that. Just a few years ago, when online stuff was becoming more prevalent, even 10, 12 years ago, the idea was, well, newspapers are going to die, you know. And the Times is not dead. In fact, look at the trend and pull that back to a weekly. It's rock solid. Th that is a beautiful chart. You know, in a year and a half, they're up 100%. Yeah. Trump's, good for, uh, Trump's good for media business. Yeah. Very, very good for media business. And his uh, failing New York Times, failing Washington Post is good for business for the New York Times and the Washington Post. It's giving life to the to the to this media industry. Yeah, that's all I got, brother. Let's wrap this one up. Let's take it out. So tomorrow, guys, obviously we're going to come back. We're going to review what's going on with the Times and SGB, uh, BGI and all of these different companies that we've been looking at. I'm going to give you guys a couple of action items. Number one, get onto Twitter and follow Matt and follow myself and follow all the tackle trading coaches. Uh, throughout the day and you know it's just a great way to get information and news I take a lot of pictures of charts and all that kind of stuff my Twitter is at Tim Justice Utah Matt what's yours uh, at Matt Justice one three also follow trading justice at trading justice and tackle trading at tackle trading and as always if you guys are not pro members of tackle trading get over there to tackle trading.com and you can sign up for a pro membership for 15 days for free and as you're, as, you're, as you're going over there, becoming a part of all things tackle trading, get over there to Trading Justice, sign up for the newsletter. And as always, subscribe to the, uh, to the uh, YouTube channel. And if you like the halftime report, it helps you apply your daily routine and generate ideas. And you just like it because you like to be entertained. Then uh, go ahead and like and share. And as always, guys, thank you for being the best part of tackle trading. Without you guys, we are nothing. So we like to uh, tell our team we love you guys. Have an absolutely great week trading, uh, great day trading, and uh, we'll see you uh, same time, same bad channel tomorrow. See you tomorrow.